Are you in awe of Him? Would you do something that is very scriptural? Matter of fact, we are commanded to do this in Scripture. It says to lift up holy hands without wrath unto God. Just lift up your hands right now to God. Father God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are here among us, that you're alive, risen from the dead. Your Holy Spirit was sent to us to move in our hearts and to walk among us and to live inside of us. We thank you right now. We are in awe of you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I'm so glad that you're joining us today. Welcome to North Church and Pastor Rodney. Uh, we are in a collection of talks right now called The Physician's Perspective, looking at the book of Luke and Acts for the next couple of months. And I want you to grab your Bible and remain standing and turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter number 24. And as you are turning there, I was reflecting upon today's topic, which is the ascension of Jesus, his leaving this earth to go back to his throne in his rightful place beside his heavenly father. And as I was thinking about what would that have been like 2,000 years ago to witness that, when it comes to flying, um, we're sneaking up on 121 years since the first flight, 121 years. Before then, people couldn't imagine people getting into some type of whatever they would call it then. And then you would just take off and you would go up. Specifically today, hundreds of people getting on a plane and just going up and then they're no longer visible in a matter of a few minutes. Can't fathom that. So his audience could not fathom watching him literally go off into heaven. Amazing story. The historical importance of that is absolutely crucial to understand. Because you see what is behind that is that Jesus' resurrection was what validated everything that was written about him, everything he said about himself. The miracles don't mean anything if he does not rise from the dead. What he said means nothing unless he rises from the dead. And so after his resurrection, he spent 40 days going around to his closest of followers who did not believe because people just don't rise from the dead. And he was revealing himself to them again and again and again for 40 days. Here's one of those accounts. In Luke chapter 24, he walks into this room where they're locked away because they're scared to death. And now they're scared because here he is walking through walls and is among them. And here's the conversation in chapter 24. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. As he spoke, he showed them his hands and feet. Still, they stood there in disbelief, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? I love this. Jesus is so awesome. And they gave him a fish, a piece of boiled fish, and he ate it as they watched. Isn't that so cool? Historically important, his ascension. But it's also spiritually impacting his ascension. How's that? You see, when he left here and he went back to heaven, he was speaking this. One, everything that I came to do has been completed and I am done and I'm going back to my rightful place beside my father. That's the first thing. Second is that in heaven, there was a triumphal entry because he has defeated death, hell, and the grave. And now he stood victorious over all that happened back in the garden. Amen. And then thirdly, he sent back what he promised, which was what? The Holy Spirit. He said, I'm going to go. When I get there, I'm going to send my Holy Spirit. That is God. God is spirit. God's going to live inside of you for those that are my followers and believe. And you're going to have everything that you need for life and godliness. There's not going to be any excuses because you're going to have the power of the Holy Spirit in you. 
And then the fourth thing on the spiritual impact is that the Bible says that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father praying for you and for me. Whatever it is you're going through, you may think you have nobody praying for you. That's a lie from Satan. You've got Jesus who rose from the dead, who's sitting by the right hand of God. He is praying for you. Isn't that awesome to think about? And then there's the practical implications. What are the practical implications? Is that Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you here forever. I'm going to come back. I'm going to establish my kingdom, my rule on this earth. And I want to look at verse number 44. Here's some of the last words that he said. Then he said, when I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me and the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. I pray that the Holy Spirit will open your minds to receive today. I, I just pray that happens. And he said, yes, it is written long ago that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead on the third day. It was also written that this message would be proclaimed in authority of his name to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all all who repent. You are witness of all these things. And now I will send the Holy Spirit, just as my father promised. But stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes and you and fills you with power from heaven. Then Jesus led them to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. Somebody say amen, the reading of God's word. Father, we thank you for the word. Open our hearts to receive it and to obey in your name. Amen. You may be seated. I think the parting words of any person is very important. Uh, Whether they're going on a long trip, whatever the scenario may be, going off to college, and they give their final parting words to their brother, sister, friend, um, mom, dad, This past week, I know that we've had a couple of people that I know of that were deployed uh, with the military. And so in their deployment, I'm sure that there was conversations with those that they love about how they're going to miss them, how they will stay in contact. Uh, They'll be praying for them. Whatever that may be, it's very important parting words. What you have here in the book of Luke 24 and also the book of Acts chapter 1 is Jesus' parting words. Let's pick up with chapter number one of Acts in verse eight. It says, but you will receive power, Jesus speaking, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them, men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus was taken from you into heaven, but someday he will come, he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. Dr. Luke here addresses three questions about Jesus's parting words. One was what Jesus was going to do in the future how to be ready for that event that was going to be taking place in the future and what to do while we are waiting for this event to take place. So first off is that Jesus, Luke wants you to know that Jesus is coming again. He wants you to know that Jesus said a lot of things about his coming and he wants you to remember that. Matter of fact, he spoke a lot about it in the book of Luke, but I'm going to give you a few of the things that Jesus said. One, is that my coming will be soon, soon. The book of Revelation 22 says this, look, I am coming soon. The last chapter in this Bible wants to remind you that I am coming soon. Now there's some people that tell me, well, pastor, soon, that doesn't sound soon to me. It's been 2000 years ago since that was said and he hasn't showed up yet. Or it's not been quite 2000 years, but it's been a while. But see, the way we think compared to the way you know, God thinks is different when it comes to time frames. It's kind of like you getting in your car if you have small children and you start to go on a trip somewhere. What is one of the first things they begin to ask? 
Are we there yet? It's universal. It happens no matter where you're from. Uh, because their understanding of time is very limited. And you can say 30 minutes, and that means nothing to them. They're going to say in four minutes, are we there yet? And it's the same way with us when it comes to the eternal things. We cannot understand and wrap our mind around the concept of time the way God understands time. Also, Jesus says that his coming will be sudden. Scripture says, for as lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one end to the other, so it will be on the day when the Son of Man comes. I don't know about you, but lightning's pretty fast, right? Okay. Well, oftentimes we hear the thunder, but the thunder happens what? It happens after the lightning because the speed of light is so much astronomically faster than the speed of sound. One, one part Jesus says, in a twinkling of an eye. That's how fast, how sudden the coming is going to be. And, and sometimes we think even that, that's, I, I've talked to parents this week who their kids, their first child is going into school and it seems like it happens so sudden. I've talked to older people that have been married for years and they said, 50 years, we've been married. It happened so suddenly. No, we know it didn't. For the person going into school, it was over a five-year plan. They just, but in the heart of the people that are expecting to happen so suddenly, for, because you just, it's, where did time go? So his coming is going to be sudden. Also, his coming is going to be unexpected. Notice what Luke says. You must be ready at all time. For the Son of Man will come when, said with me, least expected. Like Jesus said in one other part, he said that as a thief shows up unannounced, so will the coming of the Son of Man. He's not going to come when you're most expecting. That's why you've got to be ready. And then finally, it will separate. It will separate people. In the book of Luke, it says again, two women will be grinding flour together at the mill, and one will be taken, the other left. It uses several other examples, but the message that Jesus wants you to have is be ready. Be ready is his message. And you can fool a lot of people, but you cannot fool him. You can fool parents. You can fool your spouse. You can have a hidden agenda and things in your heart not really be right with God, but you cannot fool the one who created you, who knows the very thoughts and intents of your heart. You cannot and will not fool him. So that's what he's going to do. So how are we to be ready for his coming? He says this, be filled with the spirit of Jesus, Luke says. Be filled with the spirit of Jesus. That's how we're to be ready. In the book of Romans, it says clearly that the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of the fellow follower of Jesus. So if you have received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the same spirit that rose him from the dead lives inside of you. What's your excuse? What, what, are there any excuses that we should have then if that is the case and we hold on to that truth? And the first part of what it means to have Jesus inside of you is salvation. You've got to experience salvation. Jesus told Nicodemus, he said, because Nicodemus was struggling with being born again, this concept. And he said, no, no, I'm not talking about going back into your mother's womb. I'm talking about being born of spirit. He says, that which is flesh is flesh, but that which is spirit is spirit. You must be born again. That's where it starts. When you ask Christ into your heart, the spirit of God takes up resident inside of you. In fact, in John chapter 20, after Jesus' resurrection, he walks into the room and the disciples see him and they're like freaking out. And then finally they go touch him and they realize he's real. And then he says this, they said, my Lord, they believe on him. And he says, receive you the Holy Spirit. And he breathes on them. The Holy Spirit takes up residence inside of them. But then the second part and work of the Holy Spirit is the baptism in spirit, a spirit baptism that God wants to work inside of you. Because right after he has breathed upon them and said, receive the Spirit. He gives the same words to them to go and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, to go. And in Acts chapter 2, you have this experience that they happen, have with the Spirit of God. You see, because when you give your heart to Jesus Christ, you didn't just check a box and say, I'm done with my walk with Christ. No, no, no. You're just starting your walk with Christ. And the way you walk with Christ is by the Spirit that raised him from the dead lives inside of you. 
God in you. So there's more, more to the work of the Holy Spirit inside of you every day. Uh, we got in front of our house a dry creek bread bed. And so when it rains a lot, um, the neighborhood runoff will fall into that creek bed and it runs down. And sometimes it can get pretty deep. Um, and, but when it stops raining, about an hour later, there's nothing there. It dries up. And there's a lot of Christians that live their life that way. They run from experience and every once in a while they get this touch in, of the Holy Spirit in the house of God with the people of God. And they go back and they live their life throughout the week as a dry creek bed. And that's not the way you're meant to live. Jesus said this in John chapter seven. He said, for you, if you believe on me out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. That which he spoke of was the Holy Spirit. And you can have the power of the Holy Spirit in your life every day, throughout the day, at night, in the most difficult times, in your lonely moments, in your most biggest obstacle, the Holy Spirit will be there to give you exactly what you need for whatever you are facing in your life. And then also there's the spiritual gifts. You see, when you get saved and you ask Jesus in your heart, do you realize that God has deposited spiritual gifts inside of you? There's no excuse. Spiritual gifts, go, go read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It lists some of them. Go read Romans chapter 12. It lists. Go read uh, Ephesians chapter 4. But even when you read those lists, that's not meant to be completely comprehensive. Bottom line is any gift God gives to you is a good gift. And he will give you through the power of the Holy Spirit, whatever it is that you are facing in life, he will give you exactly what you need for that moment. Isn't that good to know? And, and don't, don't feel like you're, you're less than because you just recently got saved. No, 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 no. When you give your heart to Christ, those gifts are deposited in you, but new, you got to walk in the Holy Spirit every day to realize all that God has for you. This past week, we had our chapel time at the end of our chapel time, excuse me, a week and a half ago, uh, Scotty, one of the ladies who's in this experience came up for prayer and she had asked to come and we gathered around her and, uh, she had been given a very negative diagnosis from the doctors about cancer. And, uh, it was not good. It was not, they, they had said, they confirmed that this is what's going on. We prayed over her and believed God and trusted God. She went back the next day and they had scans and whatever they did. And she came back out the next day is like, they can't find anything. My God is a healing God. You know, my God works his work. Whatever it is that you're facing and you say, well, pastor, I've prayed, pray again, trust again, go to God again. Don't give up. He is a miracle working God. And then there's spiritual fruit in our life. Because when you get saved, you're meant to develop. You're meant to grow. You're meant to <laughs> become, okay? And so there's the fruit of the Spirit. And, and you, you can go around acting all spiritual all you want, but if you're absent of the fruit of the Spirit, no, 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 that's not what it's about. And the fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Come on, th those are things that money cannot buy, that only God can give. I, I want that. How about you? I need that more than a better paying job. I need that more than a new home. I need that more than a fancy car. I need that more than just the slickest of clothes. I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life, producing the fruit of the Spirit through my life. Amen? Amen. And I, I just want you to understand just a few things that I feel like is important that I think we can be in church a long time and just think I'm doing Okay. But wherever you are in your spiritual journey, I want you to understand this. You have not met all of God yet. Did you hear me? Oh, pastor, you don't know this experience I had with God. I was slain in the spirit and just God just... Kind of, you, you. Thank God for what he did then. But you have not met all of God yet. How do I know that? Because Jesus said in John chapter 3, he said that God gives the Holy Spirit without measure. One translation says, without limit. So that tells me that none of you have arrived yet. We're all on this journey with the Holy Spirit, and God is revealing himself through the working of this Holy Spirit in our lives, and he wants more for you. Trust him and go after more of God. But what does that mean for you? It means that you've got to play your part and do your thing to receive more of him. It isn't that God's just going to just make you. No, no. That's why Jesus said, seek and you will Knock and you will have it open. Ask and you will receive. 
is that we have to do our part in saying, God, I want more of you. And then also, as you receive more of God, what happens in you is not just for you. It's to impact others around you. So what happened in Acts chapter number two, when the 120 in the upper room had clothing tongues of fire and the rushing wind flow into the place, it wasn't meant to be, oh yeah, look, we're going to sit here and we're going to have just us a little great church time. No, 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 no. What happens inside of them was meant to be taken to the world, to the world. What God does for you is not just for you. It's for others that need to hear about what God can do for them. And so the final thing is this, is to be a witness, is to be a witness. Luke wants us to know that while we're waiting for his return, we need to be a witness for Jesus. The Greek word for witness is martus. It's someone who sees something important or amazing, and they have a responsibility. If you see something that's a crime, you have a responsibility to do something about it. If you see somebody mistreated, you have a responsibility. If you see something wonderful and awesome like the resurrection of Jesus Christ and life transforming in your life, you have a responsibility. And the deeper root word of martus, that Greek word, is martyr. And what you find in the book, all the gospels, and then throughout the writings of the scripture and church history, is these people that when Jesus was crucified, was running and playing scaredy cat and locking themselves away, what would change this group of individuals that had checked out on Jesus and said, okay, I'm done, all of a sudden be willing to lay down their life for Jesus? Why would his brothers who thought he was a lunatic and never believed on him while he was alive, would all of a sudden lay down their life to follow him because they saw their brother rise from the dead? And they saw the witness of the ascension. And they knew they had a mission. Whew. Charles Spurgeon says this, every person that claims to be a Christian is either an imposter or a missionary for Jesus. There's no middle ground. If you're not sharing your faith with Jesus, you need to stop and, and recheck what's going on inside of you. What's, what's happening? Acts 1 and verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. This is Jesus. And you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Over the past few weeks, just, just this past week, two things happened in the gym. I like to wear my shirts that say something that's spiritual on them. But it's not just about that. Oh, I'm being a witness for Jesus because you wear a shirt that says North Church. Let's, let's be real. But one of the things that I like to do is I, I pray. And at the end of my workout, I will find somebody that I know there and I'll say, hey, let's pray. Will you pray with me? Even if I don't know them real well. And if I don't really know anybody in the gym at that moment, I will just kneel down and pray myself. And just the other day, I had somebody, I get up from prayer and this guy walks over to me and says, hey, why do you do what you do? And you can see just the intrigue in his, in his heart, in his eyes as he looked at me why do you do what you do? And I explained to him and he's kind of nodded. He didn't say, Oh, I go to church. I want to, you know, he, no, he just kind of nodded. I don't know where he is on the journey, but I'm going to see him again. And I'm going to be keeping planting seeds. And then just this week, I saw two guys that from the church, two men. And I said, Hey, you want to pray? And I got, and I said, there's another guy across the gym. And I said, let's go find him. So we got together. We just prayed. And as soon as we stopped praying, somebody behind us, who I know is not a follower of Jesus, said, thank you. Thank you for being bold enough to pray in front of everybody. We are to be witnesses. Why is it? Why is it? Because we got the best story. We got the greatest news. Jesus is alive. Jesus has ascended. And Jesus is coming back again. And I wrote down some things that I feel like Hopefully we'll help you out. In fact, it's straight out of God's word. I didn't put any verses to it. I just wrote them down this week. And I want to share with you. And I hope they encourage you, inspire you. And you may want to go back and watch this again and write them all down and just get them in your spirit. 
because they should do something for you that says, I want others to know about Jesus. Here they go. My God created me on purpose, with a purpose, and I am beautifully and wonderfully made. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise. My Father God has good plans for me. I have a future and a hope. No weapon formed against me will prosper. I am unstoppable when operating in the will of God. I am blessed to be a blessing. My name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. My life is not my own. I have been bought at a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. The life I now live is by faith in the Son of God, Jesus, who loved me and gave himself for me. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in me. And I am salt of the earth and light of the world. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. (laughs) Nothing can separate me from the love of God. There is a divine calling on my life. I am chosen, called, set apart, and empowered to do the great work God destined for me. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. God will be faithful to keep his promises for a thousand generations. My children and their children and their children's children will be saved and covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. I will live and not die and declare the works of the Lord, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and and ever, and ever, and ever, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Come on, stand with me. Give praise to Him. Give praise to Him. Come on, give Him a hand clap of praise. He is worthy of all our praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our prayer team is coming in Guthrie, Oklahoma City. We're going to go back in and we're going to celebrate. We're going to say goodbye to the things of this world and hello to Jesus. But if you want prayer or anything, don't set back. My God is a miracle working God. Work your way out of the middle of the aisle and get down to these altars or out to the side. Somebody will pray with you in Guthrie and Oklahoma City. And let's celebrate Jesus. Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy. Do your work right now in Jesus' name. Amen.